lecture eight is, um, is today. And uh, we, are, we are just moving through the course here. Hey, everybody. Uh, we're just moving through the course on lecture eight. We're going to keep going on health, geography, and development. OK, about problem set one. I wasn't, I wasn't sufficiently clear about how to hand it in. I was thinking people would just upload it on B courses. I think that's what most of you have done. Some have brought paper copies. Since I was unclear about it, if you have the paper copy now, hand it into your GSI. They're here. And it's cool for today, either way, because I wasn't clear. But going forward, I'd like us to sort of all be on the same page. Pierre points out that maybe some of you would prefer paper. Maybe it's easier to, for them to you know, write comments or something, although they can always get you comments electronically on your problem set, too. So I want to take a vote and see if people prefer to, for the next, the next couple problem sets. For today, it's fine either way. Just make sure your GSIs know. Going forward, do you prefer to hand in your problem sets on paper or to upload them on B courses? OK, I've got a great idea. Let's use the clicker. So why don't we take out the clicker and um, paper is A. B courses is B. Let's just let the people speak. C, indifference, indifference. Indifference equals C. Some of you were saying dictatorship was better, so I'm going to ignore the vote and just decide. No, I'm just joking. Uh, OK, no, no, no. We're going to believe in democracy. These are our values. Let's, let's let the people speak. Um, <laughs> How many votes do we have? Maybe like click in a few more votes here, guys. Yeah. Sorry? I don't understand. Oh, I didn't say 3. I meant 330. Sorry, I got confused. <laughs> yeah, this here should have been. I meant by 330. Sorry. OK, so I think we've, um, we've got what we need to get. And the answer is um, really, really clear. <laughs> People want B courses. Um, what's that? What's E? I don't know. So, okay, so for today was fine either way. I wasn't clear. In the future, you just upload everything. Answers, log files from Stata, do files, everything onto B courses. And then the GSIs will type up comments oh, on question one, here's some reactions, rather than writing them. So that's just how we'll have to, have to do it. Okay, guys, that was an exercise in democracy. I like it. Um, so let's just um, keep moving. Any questions or comments on anything else before we dive back into the material? Great. So last time we were getting into the within school externalities, we spent about five minutes at the end of class starting to go through this equation, uh, the regression equation. I want to just pick up where we left off. And you know, this is what it looked like. We basically were making this distinction between the direct effect of being treated in a treatment school versus the effect of just being in a treatment school and being untreated relative to those who were in control schools and were untreated. And that's what we were calling the, I'm sorry, I'm, getting, I'm jumping ahead already to C, cross school externality. Oh, no, no, that's right. What I said is right. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused. So the, with, the within school externality effect is the effect of being in a treatment school with being untreated. And we gauge that by comparing you to untreated people in control schools. So that's the, the measure. And here, we were just discussing last time how C, the C term there, gives you that sort of extra effect of being treated if you're in a treatment school. But B is the effect for the untreated in treatment schools versus the untreated in control schools. So B is the externality, and C is the additional effect of treatment. That's what we had sort of finished up with last time. Um, so what does the data look like if we started going through this? If we do compare the untreated in group one to the controls in group two, basically none of them got treated, or very, very few, a couple percent, uh, sort of privately went out and sought the drugs, we see a difference of about 18 percentage points. So that's some indication that just being in a treatment school near all these other people who are getting treated benefited these folks' health. This is evidence for a positive spillover. <clears throat> the other term is the additional gain you get from being treated yourself, and this gain is about 10 percentage points. So if you are treated in treatment school, you do better than if you're untreated, but not by what we would think of as the full effect of treatment. And we talked about last time that studies that only randomize within schools, treatment and placebo, say treatment and control, face a problem, which is the control group is probably benefiting from being near the treatment, treatment group. So they look healthier than they might have otherwise, and that can complicate um, our interpretation of treatment effects, potentially. OK, so this is just another way to, um, to think about uh, what I just showed you, which is in the control group, if you were untreated and no one in your school was treated, average infection was about 50%, it was 52%. If you're still untreated, but you're in a treatment community, you get that gain um, C, which was 18 percentage points. And if you were treated in a treatment group, you get the additional gain of B. So your total gain is B plus C. So this is just exactly what I said, just showing you kind of graphically uh, how this might work out. So if we're going to think about the total impact of deworming, we're going to get to this more formally in a little bit. The total impact of deworming is any benefits for the treated, B plus C, plus any benefits for the untreated. So if we knew you know, the numbers or the proportions in these different groups, we could kind of add them up and get the total gain. Let me pause. This is, we, we said all this last time, but just wanted to get us all back on the same page. You guys all up to speed on this? Any questions? Right at the end of the lecture, someone on the way out asked a question, a very good question. It was something that sort of was anticipating what I was going to bring in, which is the question of, wait a minute, wait a minute. These treated and untreated in group one, as we you know, discussed a little bit last time, within the treatment school, those guys aren't randomly chosen. Some people got treated, some people didn't get treated. About 75% got treated. Some of them didn't get treated because they were absent. Some of them didn't get treated because they refused the drugs. Um, some of the older girls in the school, there was a, actually this has changed since then, but at the time, the World Health Organization recommendation in mass treatment programs was to exclude uh, girls uh, who were menstruating or of, of sort of, of past menarche. Basically, they were of childbearing age, roughly defined. So girls over 13, girls over 14, somewhere in that range, because there was a fear that the drugs could harm a fetus if the girl happened to be pregnant. Now, when you think about it, you know, very few 13 or 14-year-old girls were pregnant to start with. It's a very low probability event. A, B, there was a lot of uncertainty about what risks there would be to the fetus. 
um, relative to what you knew were the direct gains of getting rid of the worm infection. So the World Health Organization has actually changed this policy, also based on some new evidence that there's very unlikely to be any harm to a fetus. So now in school programs, there's mass treatment of everybody, even these young adolescent women or girls of you know, over 13 or 14. But th that was another reason why some, some of these uh, kids did not get treated. So there were a variety of reasons why people were untreated. And you might think that those different reasons would lead to different baseline infection levels. So for instance, probably the most important reason why people were untreated is they happened to be absent on the day the drugs were administered. Now, if you think that people who are sick or likely to be sick often are also more likely to miss that day because they're homesick, then you might think sick people are the ones missing deworming treatment. And if some of their illness is due, to deworm is due to worm infections, you might actually fear that the sickest kids with the worst worm infections were the ones who missed the treatment day. So that's one possibility. That wouldn't be great. You'd really want to make sure those guys got treated. That's one type of selection bias, as we would call it in economics, non-random selection into treatment. What would be a kind of story that would go the other way that would, that would suggest that actually um, sicker people would be more likely to get treated? rather than less likely. I just told you the story for why these guys are homesick, so they miss the treatment. What would be the opposite explanation for why sicker people would be more likely to get treated? Yeah, they're aware that they're ill. Then even if they're sick, they're going to make like double effort to make sure they're in school that day because the benefits to them presumably are greater. So actually, there's this like, really plausible story that could go either way. So um, it's kind of interesting to wonder, so who, who are these people? And that brings us to our first real clicker question. That poll before, you know, that was a fake clicker poll. Um, so this is the question. Do you think infection rates were higher on average among those who received treatment? In other words, the sicker guys were like, I'm going to go get treated no matter what. That's A. B. Do you think infection rates were lower among those who received treatment because they were just more likely to be in school that day? They, had, they sort of had their act together to get to school. C, infection rates were about the same, regardless of your uh, sort of, you know, infection rates were, were similar for those who did and did not receive treatment. Or D, like it's just too hard to know because these are both plausible. You have a question? Yeah, the treatment yeah, great question. So I told you before that the school visits for attendance were unannounced, but the treatment day was different. The treatment day was not a school attendance day. It was pre-announced that it was a treatment day, and they really tried to inform the community to get everybody to come. So because it was pre-announced, you might be able to get these kinds of phenomena of people making sure they were going to be there. Let's say. Okay, so what do people think? Another 10 seconds. OK, so this is really interesting. There's a lot of spread. This is our kind of most even poll we've had so far. Some of you are like, I have no idea. That's reasonable. But if we lump together the no idea and maybe they're equal, just say, you know, like, these are people who are maybe on the fence between the two, then that looks like it's our, you know, our largest group. That's it. It's roughly a third, a third, a third. Um, OK, so let me show you the, the result on the next slide. Oops, that isn't going to help. <laughs> there we go. OK, so which one was right? A, B, or C? Um, these are pretty close. These are pretty close. So the fact that it was very split is interesting. Um, they're almost identical. But I haven't shown you there's a lot of other characteristics we have for the people who ended up getting treated and those who didn't get treated. And remarkably, other than this issue that a bunch of older girls were the ones who were untreated, the characteristics of these guys' households are very similar. Latrine ownership. Remember I talked about livestock ownership. All that stuff is really similar across these groups, and their infection rates are almost the same. So it's clearly not randomized who got treated and who did it. There are differences, probably, some unobserved differences, but they're not radically different groups. So that was surprising to us. As I mentioned, there are these different effects that would sort of push sicker people to be more or less likely to get treated, right? Like, I'm sicker, so I'm less likely to be there on the day of treatment, but I'm sicker, so I kind of want to get the treatment, right? And it looks like roughly those effects cancel here. So kind of interesting. Pretty good, pretty good balance. And yeah. OK. Um, so I think A was the one which said that um, infection rates are higher among those who receive treatment. B is um, infection rates were lower among those who receive treatment. So actually, B is correct in that they're lower, but they're very similar. So either B or C, I think, are, are broadly you know, right. But, but they're so close that C kind of feels like the right answer. It isn't like a very sharp selection, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah, treatment within the school. Everybody within the school was offered treatment in the treatment schools. The randomization was across schools. There were treatment schools and control schools. And the NGO that was carrying out, the nonprofit organization that was carrying out this intervention, wanted everybody possible to get treated in the treatment schools. They had information sessions. They, you know, the drugs were free. They brought them to the school. They did everything they could so that everybody would get treated. And about three quarters of the people were treated. But that quarter of people who were not treated don't look like radically different from those who were treated. So that was interesting for us. We didn't really know what the answer would be to this, this question. Okay. Any other kind of comments or thoughts on these patterns? OK, so what I want to do next is the third piece of the puzzle. We've talked about the sort of direct treatment effect across treatment and control schools, and then the within school externalities, and now cross school externalities. And it's going to turn out the econometrics are very similar. So I think we can kind of quickly go through the regression equation. But conceptually, they're different, at least somewhat different. The within school externalities are really easy to understand. We're in the same community, we're going to school together, we're sitting next to each other. And because we're like in such close proximity, we, you know, we infect each other in the same school. The cross school externalities are the same idea, but over a greater distance. The idea is even though we're not literally next to each other all the time and hanging out, even if we're, we live a couple kilometers away from each other, somehow my infection status affects you. And there's a couple reasons that could occur. Kids go to play in certain areas. When kids go out to play for a couple of hours in certain areas, um, there could be contaminated fecal matter there after a couple hours if they're not using latrine. Kids also go to play not just in certain you know, areas to run around and play, but they go to the lake to play. And there, there are certain points on the lake that are good for fishing. There are certain points on the lake that are good for bathing that a lot of people sort of converge on. So that's another reason why you might see effects over longer distances. If kids within a certain radius are all going to the same point in the lake, they could again be sort of transmitting the infection to each other through the infected fresh water. But even on land, kids play together. They have friends that live a 10 to 15 minute walk away. 
they play together and they can basically infect each other. Their hands are dirty, et cetera. Okay, so um, what we find is particularly large reductions in infection within about three kilometers of treatment schools for kids in other schools located within about three kilometers, that's about two miles, with some smaller effects out to even six kilometers, but it's more concentrated within a couple miles. How does this you know, look like graphically? I want to go through the map to explain the idea to you. So you see that little red arrow? It's pointing at a school that has a two. So that's a group two school. You know, the ones, twos, and threes denote the group, these three groups that we have. So that's a group two school. And I've drawn a radius of a couple of kilometers around that school. This is the real map. What do you notice about the other schools that are close by? They all happen to be group one schools. Now, again, your assignment to groups one, two, and three was driven by this list randomization. It's not systematic. It's sort of like the schools look very similar. They're scattered all around. I've obviously deliberately chosen this one because it just by chance happens to be a school surrounded by group one schools. What do you think the infection environment is going to look like for that group two school after a year of deworming? It's going to be better, right? All the kids around them within however many kilometers have gotten dewormed. There's going to be less infected fecal matter in the environment. You know those kids. You would expect they'd be reinfected less. Over time, the worms in their bodies are going to die off. I think I mentioned last week, worms have a lifespan of about one year, maybe two years. So, you know, after a year where everybody around you is being treated, you're going to be healthier. The worms inside your body are going to be dying off. You're not going to get reinfected. So you expect this guy to be healthier. Yeah. I'm talking about the, you, you see the number two where the arrow is pointing? So just consider that's the school we're going to focus on. And then I drew a blue circle around that school, centered at that school. So let's consider the school just within a couple kilometers of, of that group two school. Now let's consider a different school. That's also, I pointed the little red arrow at another group two school, and I've drawn the same size circle around it. What do you notice about the schools around that group two school? There's no group ones. So in 1998, none of those group two or three schools were getting treated. Basically, that group two school didn't get treatment themselves, and no one near them got treatment. They're very much like a pure control. There's just, it'd be very hard to imagine that they'd be affected by too much by the deworming unless they were affected by schools farther away. Yeah. Yeah, that's really due to jittering on the map. That school is basically right on the border. And yeah, so it's a Kenyan school. And this one here is like a very swampy, marshy area, I think I mentioned. It's not literally like, you know, build, it's not like Dubai. Or one of these places where they build cities in the water or something like that, you know, islands in the water. It's just like a swampy area. So um, yeah, so these are all, all Kenyan schools. Anyway, look at the contrast between those two circles. They're both group two schools. They're both in Funula, this one of the two geographic areas. They're very similar in terms of their observed characteristics. One just happens to be surrounded by group one schools due to the randomization, and one has no group one schools around. So with cross-school externalities, what we want to do is use that variation to our advantage and say, if you happen to be surrounded by lots of group one schools, are you healthier the next year? That's the question. So we're actually extending the externality question beyond the school to the, basically the local area. Let me pause and see if there's any, any questions. Budalong and Funula, these two areas. The most important difference is um, there's a couple differences. Funula is a little more densely populated and a little richer in our data. Not a ton, but a little bit. Um, and more of Budalong is close to the lake, a greater share. And a lot of those are fishing communities, and they just have their own kind of characteristics. So there were no radical differences, but you know, some, let's say, moderate differences. One thing I will say is um, there's 75 schools here. In total, between Budalong and Funula, there were 89 primary schools at the time. So there were 14 that were excluded. You could ask, you know, why were they excluded? The bulk of those schools that were excluded were schools in a couple of the bigger towns in this area that were like, you could think of them as a little bit more elite boarding schools. There were a few like rich boarding schools they were excluded. There were a few single sex schools that were excluded. We wanted to have sort of comparable co-ed uh, schools. Um, there were two schools that in 1997 had served as pilot schools when the NGO was just figuring out how to do the logistics of deworming. They were excluded. So that eliminated, between those three or four reasons, 14 of the 89 schools um, were excluded. So some of those schools were a bit different. Some of the richer town schools were a bit different. But these are basically like rural, pretty comparable rural schools. Yeah, yeah. So what ends up happening is the worm, worm eggs in fecal matter, if people defecate in the lake or infected fecal matter gets in the lake, then the worm larvae like swim through the water until they find a snail. And the snail is the intermediate host. And then the parasite changes within the snail and gets released back into the water. So if you're swimming in the water, you get in contact with that kind of second version of the parasite, which touches your skin and gets through your skin and kind of itches, and you get infected. So thankfully, snails are slow. And you know, they're only going to move a certain distance over time. So that kind of slows it down um, a little bit. But, um, so it's not like if you touch water, you're definitely going to be infected. There just has to be a parasite there that happens to be there. But obviously, the more infected fecal matter, say, in one particular area, the more the snails are going to get infected, and the more the parasites will be floating around. So yes, many parts of the lake where there's human habitation have schistosomiasis. All throughout the lake, in the Tanzanian parts of the lake, the Ugandan parts of the lake, Victoria's between the three countries. But it isn't like automatic. It isn't like you're gonna, you know, get, get infected in one second. It just depends on whether you're a little unlucky. Okay. Yeah. So what is the average reduction in infection? I'm gonna tell you the, the, the number because it's really big, and then we'll go to the regression equation. The average reduction is a little harder to compute than the within-school externality because we have to take into account the proportion of schools near you that got treated, as I'll show you in the regression. But we also need to know the average density of schools. To get the average effect, we need to know the average effect of having sort of more schools near you be treated, but also know what that typical proportion is. That gives you the average effect of this program. So the average effect is huge. It's 20 percentage points. Remember, the within-school externality was about the same. That was about 18 percentage points. So there's a big externality right within your school community, and an equally big one out to, say, three kilometers of your school. So there really is a very large spillover effect of treatment. And once you add up the within-school externality and the cross-school externality, they're really much, much bigger than just the direct effect of being treated in a treatment school on top of you know, th that additional effect beyond the control group was relatively small. That was like 10 percentage points. So the externalities are the bulk of the treatment effect. That's a very important finding. Okay. And there's an advantage to the cross-school externality approach, which is, remember, the within-school externality relied on the fact that some people got treated and other